Okay, can you hear me well? Is it too loud? Is it okay? Okay. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank those of you who submitted comments about the specifics in the lecture. And um, I will try to take those into consideration. I know that um, the uh, symbols in as we start this class seem to be confusing. And um, they are, many of them, different from the ones you've used in your physics classes and math classes. But we will try to use consistently what uh, you would normally find in engineering books. And so I will try also myself to be clear when I use these uh, formulations. They, I found two papers which I'm going to upload on Canvas that explain the, difference the differences between the spherical coordinate systems, the way that people are using them in mathematics, and the way we use them in engineering. So. The theta and phi, I understand from some discussions with you, are used differently. But I will try to give uh, to put this on Canvas uh, later today for your information. And the same thing applies to the symbols we use for the different charge densities. So knowing that you come from a background that you use where you use different symbols, I'll try to at least write on the board the symbols we are using for this class and how we use them. OK, so um, today we are going to start with a summary of the uh, and examples from the previous class. Tomorrow we are going to solve problems and then try to prepare for Wednesday's quiz, which primarily will be on the first two chapters that we've done and uh, the material we, so the, the, the um, conduction current that we will cover today. And so we'll solve problems on those. And then um, I will tell you that we are going to only use one hour for the quiz on Wednesday. So we are going to use the first hour to cover additional problems. And then I'm going to use the second hour for the quiz. All right, you're going to have a group quiz and then an individual. Same kind of problem, different questions. OK? So if you have any more questions about that, you can let me know. I can provide some more information um, towards the end of the class. Yes? Which one? The quiz is this Wednesday. Cover the first two chapters of the book we cover. And just the conduction current from today's presentation. OK? All right, so um, for summary, let me also, since for some of you may not um, see what I'm writing on the board clearly, I'll, I'll try to also um, show on the screen whatever notes I have available. So let me see. Try to do that. OK. So uh, last time we covered boundary conditions. We came back to them. And then I would like to review them again. So we have, we've talked about boundary conditions on interfaces between, and those were dielectric, dielectric interfaces, like the one you see up there, or dielectric metallic interfaces, or how else we call them, dielectric conductor interfaces. So for, in this one, you will see that I have placed the arrows of, or the uh, vectors of the electric fields a little differently from the book. And I did it only to make it more clear uh, about which are um, showing what, and then so we can work on this. So in other words, what I've done here is I considered a, an interface between two dielectrics. So this is a dielectric with epsilon 1. And then we assume that we have an electric field E1 as a vector. And this is epsilon 2 and E2. 
And then I, I identify a point O, observation point on the interface. And at this point, instead of having the two vectors, one next to the other as the book does, which is okay, you can do that. Practically, they are both vectors that express the value of the electric field just above the interface at this point O or just below the interface at this point O, all right? Now, what I've done to just simplify it, and that's how I'm using it in electromagnetics, is I use this vector, for example, to show the value of V1 at this point O. And then, um, instead of using a different vector here like the book did, I use the uh, electric field vector that comes from the lower dielectric, like here. They are both vectors that apply, they show the electric field right at this point O. But they are displaced, and so it's easier to draw things. All right? So what we said um, for boundary conditions is that the tangential components of the electric field are continuous through the interface. All right? So our boundary conditions, sometimes you will see them like this. This is not BC. Is boundary conditions right, when you see them, when I write them, just for an uh, abbreviated way. It says that E T1 equals to E T2 at point O. Why do I use vectors for these two? tangential components because they may, if we are using an x, y, z coordinate system, if for example, I want to use an x, y, and z, where this is your z, normal to the interface, this is the y, and then the x is going to come like that, all right, outside of the board, towards my direction. Then, or if you want to show it like this, it's going to probably be like that, okay? If you want to show it in three dimensions. If x, y is the plane of the interface, then your tangential components will have, in general, two components, the x and the y. And that's why I have them as vectors, all right, and not as scalars. Now, also, what we know that the normal component of this um, of the electric flux density is continuous through the interface. And that, of course, assumes that there are no charges accumulated on the interface, all right? If they were, I would have uh, made a note about that. I would have uh, given this to you. So why do I have, in this particular case, this as a scalar? Because really, for me, is the Z component in this particular case. All right, so for us to be able to apply these conditions, we need to find the two components of the A field. Specifically here, I would say, if you want to change that condition into electric field, then you will say this is epsilon 1, E1, normal, should be equal to epsilon 2, E2, normal. All right? So we have this condition and we have this one. So here, to be able to find the tangential component, we just make a projection here on this plane and it's this one, E T1. And then here will be this one, E T2, all right? And so for this to be accurate, So also it looks visually that they are the same. This is E2. So this is the tangential here, and then the tangential. So these two show tangential component at this point O. This comes from the upper dielectric. This comes from the lower dielectric. The two of them have to be identical. That's one condition. Then in addition to that, 
the normal components have to be related. So if this is the normal component of the electric field, E1 at this point now, and this is the normal component of the electric field, E2 at this point O, they have to be related through this. OK? So we've seen that. These are, from, these are the conditions we've talked about last time. From this one, we are going to derive an important equation that is called the diffraction equation. And what that really does is that it provides a relationship between this angle here, A2, and this one, A1. Okay, so um, if we go a little here, I have now taken this and I have expanded it. So I'm going here, again, point P, O, O. This is my electric field E1 at O. This is electric field E2 at O. So one is this projection ET1, and the normal component comes from here, E1N. And then here, ET2, and this one, E2N. All right, now if this is A1 and this is A2, then we can write the tangential component and the normal component in terms of the E1 and then of course the angle A1. So here, to just simplify things even further so we don't have these vectors to carry the vectors, I will assume now, even for further simplification, that these vectors are only on the zy plane, all right? I simplify things. I don't have to do that. It's just a simplification. So I will assume at this point that ET1, practically according to that, if I assume that my vectors are on the yz plane, this is the vector here, E1, and therefore the only, and this would be A1, all right? And the only thing I have to do to find E T1 will be to, mu to multiply this vector E1, or the amplitude of this vector, with what? With the sine of A1, all right? So practically, according to this, we have that E T1 is going to be E1 sine of A1. And since I've made the simplification, what direction is ET1 going to have? According to that, along the positive y direction. Okay, that's I've made that simplification. Okay, and then what do I know about EN1? EN1, therefore, or 1N, as I have put here, is going to be E1 cosine, of course, A1. And then I can do the same thing about um, the uh, electric field in medium two. So this is medium one, medium two. And so what I have about medium two is that E T two will be E two sine A two. And then normal component will be E two cosine A two. And then I can take the ratio. All right, first of all, I have to find, I have to make sure that we understand ET1 and ET2 have to be identical. All right, so this one here will give us then E1 sine A1 will be equal to E2 sine e A2. And this one will give us if I make the substitutions, 
I will write it here. It will give us that epsilon 1, E1, cosine A1 would be, will be epsilon 2, E2, cosine A2. And then I just divide these two. And that gives me the um, refraction or diffraction equation, which is tangent A1 divided by tangent A2 equal to the ratio of epsilon 1 over epsilon 2. And we'll see that also later when we have plane waves and so forth. But this is the fundamental relationship that tells us that on one dielectric dielectric interface at 1.0 this relationship so the two angles have to be c uh, related to the ratio of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 through this one all right so do you remember how tangents change you need to um, we will do uh, some examples on this but um, you will need to go back and remember what is the tangent of one uh, excuse me the tangent of zero zero and when is the um, tangent of um, an angle equal when an, the angle is pi over two or 90 degrees how much is that okay infinity and then when is it 1? 45. All right, these are simple things because then you can, you just need to remember how tangents go. All right, it goes like this and so forth. Um, to be able to get an idea, you will see some examples that you will need to remember those values to be able to respond to some of the questions. Yes. Uh, this one, you're talking about this equation? This one. This one comes out of the tangential components that they have to be equal. These two are equal, yes, so here. These two are equal and these two are equal. And then we can divide the two, all right? Assuming, of course, that one of those is, uh, you divide, assume that you don't divide by zero. So you divide the two, and because they're equal, the ratio of the two will be, of one, of these two will be the same with the ratio of these two. And then you divide, you simplify by E sub one, simplify by E sub two, and then gives you this, okay? Any questions about that? All right. Um, so with this problem, we tried also to review a little bit of uh, the, the um, boundary conditions on the dielectric-dielectric interface. We spoke about capacitors quite a bit, and then I will revisit um, capacitors just to introduce the concept of a, the energy in a capacitor. And um, from there also, we will move to the concept of the dielectric breakdown, all right? But so we'll, we're gonna try to do that, uh, specifically working on a capacitor problem. Any questions so far? Yes. Have you ever spoken, for example, of dielectric uh, heavy ion phase? Yes, the, yes. Um, the only conditions, um, and then we will come back to that. I did not want to introduce the concept of nonlinear dielectrics this early, but uh, the only assumption that we've made is that those dielectrics uh, are linear, meaning, and uniform, meaning that epsilon does not change from one point of the dielectric to another, and also that. Um, the relationships between D and E is through a scalar constant. 
um, for example, why am I saying that? There are materials that are nonlinear. They are uh, either in nature like this or we make them for other purposes and they come out to be nonlinear. And in that particular case, D will be a function of this constant epsilon and E, but through a more complex relationship. All right, so now in a, um, you, in a linear material, the relationship is very simple. And as a matter of fact, linear and uniform um, means that this is a scalar constant and therefore the relationship between D and E is a very simple scalar relationship and practically does not change. These relationships can be a lot more complex and um, none of this will apply if you don't have this simple relationship, but you have something different, which involves higher powers of electric field, okay? So that's the only assumption. Other than that, um, we assume, for example, values of um, epsilon one from very, very small to very, very high. The other thing that we have not done so far is to assume, we, su we assume so far that these ones are um, real values. And um, as you will see, later when we introduce phasors, like complex numbers, that these ones can be complex. So, so far, simple stuff, okay? Any other questions? Okay. Let's go and talk about a capacitor. Okay, we assume that we have, now um, I'm going to go back to the coordinate, uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Z, X, Y, and Z here. And then we'll assume that on this, we have a capacitor parallel plate, so it's an ideal parallel plate capacitor. And I will, in fact, here. Okay. Maybe I need to lower this because I don't know whether you can see in this area. It's in the shadow. Okay, two parallel plates, um, one is here, and the other one is here. We assume that we connect that to a source, voltage V zero, V sub naught, or V sub D, just to be. We assume that we have a total charge plus Q here, plus Q, and therefore we will have a total charge minus Q here. We assume that this is H, this is W, this is L, okay. Uh, and then we assume that this now has been filled with a dielectric epsilon. 
So what we've said is all of the, since it's an ideal parallel place capacitor, and then has an area A, all right, that's area A, A, and A will be WL, L. We know then that all of the charge distri is distributed here. In fact, sometimes I have it underneath it just because I need more space. So right on the sur lower surface of the conductor. This is not inside the dielectric. I'll just do it like this because I need more space. But it's right in the lower sur on the lower surface of this conductor. And here we have negative charge on the upper surface of the lower conductor. And this is conductor one, this is conductor two, and the field lines go like this. All right? And like that. Everywhere the same. No edge effects, E naught or E, E. And in this case, E is going to be along the negative z direction, obviously, all right? What are the things that we've discussed? First of all, when you have the total charge distributed on the lower surface of the conductor, then what is this ratio? What do we call this ratio, the, the uh, ratio Q over the area? If we divide the charge, with the area, what do we get? A charge density. And what kind of density is that? Surface, all right? So usually the charge density, we show it like that. So here, I have to say, talking about symbol, um, we use Q or Q for total charges most of the time, all right? Um, Total charges, though, whether it is one point charge or whether it's a charge distributed over an area. Sometimes you will see Q sub S or Q sub S, capital Q, when those total charges are distributed on a surface. Okay? Here are at points, here are on a surface. Sometimes you will see it also as Q sub L when it's a line charge, all right, or Q sub L. So all of your charge is along a line. That's what it means. All of your charge, whether it's a small Q or high Q, is on a surface. And then here is charge that may be either at a point or in three dimensions, all right? That's how we normally use those symbols. When we talk about explicitly about charge density, then we use um, the following symbols. Of course, again, Q for the total charge. Uh, um, in fact, Q for the total charge, and then we start. Rho sub V for volume charge density. Rho sub S for surface charge density, and Rosa Bell for line charge density. But explicitly, these are densities. Now, you can tell me that there is a fuzzy area between these entities and those entities, all right? Sometimes you may want to talk about one charge Q, but in reality, it's one tiny charge at one point in space. And this is not any different physically speaking, than one of these. But when we write the formulas, this, this is for densities, therefore, densities. And this is for charges. All right, sometimes, sometimes, in some electrical engineering books, you will see instead of a surface charge density, you may see a sigma. 
and instead of line, charge density, you may see this lambda or L. I'm, not, I'm staying away from these two because we will use them from other things, but I want to just let you know that this is what people are using, okay? The other thing about, since we talk about symbols and densities or charges, in the density, if this is Coulomb, a volume charge density is gonna be in watt units? Coulomb per watt per meter cube, okay? Uh, surface charge density is gonna be in Coulomb per meter square. And then in line charge density is gonna be Coulomb per meter. These ones also, you may, when you see their units, their units will be very similar to that in many ways, all right? In this may be total, of course, Coulombs, but if this is a charge that distributes on a surface, somebody may give it to you in Coulombs per surface area units. All right, so what I'm trying to tell you is that this is what we are using for densities. However, even if we use this for charges and then you have a charge, a point charge, a surface charge and a line charge, their units, they may be given to you the same way. Their units may be similar. So I will try to be very clear in this one about the units between charge densities and total charges, but I, got, I just wanted you to know that if you try to look for help in other texts or on the web, you may see that. All right, so for me now, the densities will be in this form, and these are their units. Therefore, if this is in coulombs, what is the unit of this one? Okay? All right. Um, what did we prove last time when we solved the problem inside? And I'm not going to do the problem again, but I will remind you. What did we find? We found that the flux density, of course, as a vector is epsilon E inside the dielectric, all right? Since E is along the Z direction, of course, this is along the negative Z, of course, D is gonna be along the negative Z direction. And also we found that if I write this as d sub z, z, then we found that d sub z, which is the one component of d, is nothing else but the charge here, um, rho sub s, Rho sub s at this point. Of course, it has a negative um, number because the direction of this of d sub z is considering this coordinate system goes along the negative z. All right. So I will say here, and as I pu as I put it in my notes. Um, in fact, I will do this. I will write here that as minus z to remember that this negative comes from the direction, and of course this d sub z is gonna be rho sub s, which means, and of course rho sub s is q over a. That's what we found from a solution of the capacitors problem, which means from here that d, that e, e, I can, Erase that for now. That means that E, which is also along the negative Z direction, the value of E is nothing else but Q over epsilon A. And why I have it with a negative in my notes, I'll use, let me follow that, I don't wanna change. All right, because I have that E equals this one 
Q over E minus Q over epsilon A Z. All right, this is exactly the solution. Um, do you remember when we did those derivations last time? Do you have any questions about this? All right. If I don't hear any, if you want me, if you don't want me to explain anymore, I will assume that this is fine with you. So E, therefore, is given by this. Or you can say that Q in this case is minus epsilon A E sub Z. All right? Here is the vector. All right. Now, what else do we know in this capacitor? We know that the voltage difference, or the, the potential difference, or the voltage drop between conductor one and conductor two is minus, according to the formula, E dot DL. And that tells us that V1 minus V2, this is the potential difference between the two conductors, equal to Q epsilon A times H. Why is that? Because this is a constant. You saw that. The two negatives cancel out. They give a positive. And then you have a constant, and then the line integral along this path, which gives H. And from here, if you want to just say this is V sub D, then V sub D will be Q over epsilon A H. All right. Now, let us go to the definition of the capacitance. How much is the capacitance in this capacitor? Q over total Q over V sub D. And therefore, we find again, as we did last time, that the capacitance is also is epsilon A. Divi epsilon area divided by H. All right. The last thing that we did not do last time, and we are going to um, talk about this now, is something that you have seen before in your previous physics class, that the electric energy, W sub E. So there is a capacitor. It has a capacitance. There is a charge that has been accumulated here. There is a voltage that provides, there is a source that provides this charge. And since there is an electric field that is generated between the two plates, then you have an electric energy that is stored in this capacitor. A capacitor is a storage element and stores electric energy. And the electric energy that it stores W sub E is given by this formula. 1 over 2 C V square V sub D C V sub D square or whatever V applies to the two plates of the capacitor. All right? So if V is a general voltage, all right, in this particular case we called it V sub D, then this formula will be W sub B will be 1 over 2 C V squared. This is the general formula that you have seen before. For us, C is going to be C is going to be this one and V or V sub D is going to be this one. Okay? or whatever values we give for the problem. So sometimes when we give problems like that, either I will, we will know the source, 
will know the voltage that applies, then we have to find everything else. Or we'll be given the charge that applies, that has been placed on the one capacitor. And of course, it's negative on the other. And then we will have to find everything else. All right? So if we know the voltage, we can find the charge. They're not going to give us both. If they give us both, then in reality, they are forcing these parameters to have a particular relationship. OK? But these are this one, one, two, three, four. These are the important equations for a capacitor. Any questions? OK. Last time, then, um, we talked about having multiple dielectrics in there. But before we go to the multiple dielectrics, um, then, um, and, and do one small example to remind you, I um, wanted to speak about the dielectric breakdown. Do you know what is? Have you heard about the dielectric breakdown? Do you know what it is? OK, what it means is the following. Uh, whether you have air in this capacitor or you have another material, when you start putting an electric field, and let's assume that you have a very large source, and then you can put a lot of charge on the two plates so that the value of the electri electric field becomes very, very large, there is a point where the energy we give into the electrons of this material medium becomes so high that all of the, even if they are dipole moments, all right, they are not free electrons, they get so much energy from the source that they break free from their atoms. When they break free and they started moving with very high speeds, then what, this, what does it happen to this material? It changes from dielectric to what? To a conductor. Because you have all of these free electrons, all right? You remember the characteristic of a conductor is, or a conducting or a metal, is that they have a lot of free electrons that they move. And they move very fast, and they create currents. In this particular case, you have a dielectric. And with very um, low values of the electric field, the dipole moments will turn left or right. But the electrons are not going to break free from the atoms. But if they get too much energy, very high n uh, numbers of um, energy, then all of the electrons, even the bound electrons, will become free, and they will start um, moving with very high speeds. And so you have conduction through the material. In lightning, that is what's happening. All right, You have a cloud with a very high charge. And then there is so much static electric energy that is provided between either two clouds, all right, or one cloud and the ground, which is like all of the negative charge accumulates there, that all of the electrons that are in, f in the air, and you may have also water in there, all right, humidity, so you will have a medium that has a lot of dipole moments. A lot of these electrons will break loose. And then you have this current that flows between the cloud and the ground. And that's the lighting that we see, all right? It breaks. Now, what happens to the dielectric when you um, have this problem? The dielectric is damaged. The moment, the dipole moments, the moment they, um, the electrons leave their um, atoms, they break loose from the nucleus, then it changes microscopically and then macroscopically also the material. And so you see that the material is damaged. And that is called um, the electric breakdown and requires very high values of the electric field for this to happen. For air, for example, the value of the electric field can be 10 megavolts 
permitted. This is huge. And we never get to these values, all right? You can have volt, millivolt, go to megavolts, it's 10 to the 6. When you have a dielectric, it gets higher. For dielectric, it can go to 40, 60. But still, if you reach that value, then you damage your dielectric. And then it becomes a conductor. You don't have a capacitor. All right, so that's the um, dielectric breakdown. Any questions on those? All right, no questions. Let's try then to remember what we do if we take a dielectric, a, a capacitor, in the dielectric of the capacitor, and then we use many layers of dielectrics, all right, in, instead of one, either horizontally or vertically or a combination of the two. Without rederiving things, I'm going to remind you that if we get a parallel plate capacitor, like the previous one, area A here, and we have the lower conducting plate, oops, sorry, and um, Let's take, first of all, this one, two dielectrics, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, all right? Um, what did we say last time? First of all, we said s important things. This is a dielectric, dielect dielectric interface. We expect the tangential components to be zero, uh, excuse me, <laughs> to be equal. Are they going to be equal here? Yes, because there is only the normal component, all right? There is no tangential component. So since the electric field goes like that, tangential components are zero, therefore are equal. Here is going to be E1, E2. What else happens at the interface? The normal component of the elect electric flux density, D, will be continuous. So at this point, D N1 and D N2, all right? If this is the uh, vector of the electric flux density at this point, and this is the vector of the electric flux density from the lower mat medium at this point, these two vectors are parallel because they are perpendicular to the interface. And what are they going to be at that interface equal? So D N1, which is epsilon 1 E1, and D N2, which is epsilon 2 E2, will be equal, which means that epsilon 1 E1 should be equal to epsilon 2 E2. Because the electric field here is constant, the electric field here is constant, and the products of the electric fields with their respective electric permittivities, all right, these products are equal. Okay, so that we understand. We, are go we found last time that the capacitance of this structure, if we put here a source, and if we have here, the source, say, V, V, and is connected with one capacitor. We found last time that this capacitor is nothing else, all right, but the series combination of two capacitances, all right? <coughs> one capacitance that comes from this part, C1, the other who come, which comes from this part, C2. And since we are going to, if we use the formula that we calculated just previously, C1 will be epsilon 1, A, 
divided by h1, all right? So this is h1, and this is h2, and c2 will be epsilon 2 a divided by h2, and these are two capacitors in series. And how do we combine capacitors in series? The total capacitance here, C, is 1 over C, connect, is related to these two by this formula. OK? And do you remember when we connect two capacitors like this? What happens to this value of the total capacitance? is lower than either of the two, or both of the two, all right? It's lower than C1, and it's going to be lower than C2. So that's what we have in this case. What happens now if we have this case, as we said last time, we then divide the space uh, vertically, still ideal capacitor. So epsilon 1, epsilon 2, then this area A1, this area A2, and total thickness the same H. What is then the total capacitance of this structure? C. If we, let's assume, put here a, all right, then B. So the total capacitance for this structure is going to be equivalent to what? Two capacitances in parallel. One C1, C1, and the other C2. C2, OK? Which means the total C, therefore, total C, C1 plus C2. So the total C is bigger than both of them. And what happens if we take one of them and then we divide it horizontally? And then this is epsilon 2 and this is epsilon 3. Then we are going to look at these two pieces and say, this has one capacitance C1 and this has another combined capacitance, all right? So let me erase now this one. So what we are going to do here is we'll say, OK, this capacitance here is C1. And C1 is what? Epsilon 1 A1 over H. And this is a combined capacitance. Let's assume I call it capacitance 2, 3, because I don't know what it is. The only thing that I know is C2, 3 is a, par is a series combination, series <coughs> combination of C2 and C3, where C2 is this capacitance, which is epsilon 2, A2, and then obviously this is going to be H2 and H3 and then H2 here, and C3 will be epsilon 3, A2 over H3, okay? And it's a series combination. So the C23 is going to be given by that. But then also we know these two capacitances, C1, and C23 will be a parallel combination. So the total capacitance of all of this will be C1 plus C23, where C23 is given by that. All right, is that clear? You can keep doing this forever. You can take another piece here. Cut it like this, cut it horizontally. The same thing applies, keeps going. Any questions so far? 
Yes. Because they have the two and three, yeah. they have different dielectric constant. Yeah. Now, why they did it like that, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is just so to show you how you can solve. You rarely see something like this. Um, you may see something like this. Rarely see something like that. But in any case, if you can take a real case scenario and you can approximate it like this, then actually you can find a good value for the capacitance by using these formulas. Any questions? OK. Now, let's see. Time. What time is it? OK. I will then, um, let's try to do one small problem. And then I'm going to go and introduce the um, conduction current. All right, so it's going to be an introduction to chapter 3. And chapter 3 has different things, but we'll talk only about conduction currents today. However, before we go there, I would like us to solve a small problem on tap hat. All right, here this problem says the following. So I will try to attract your attention to what exactly says. So we have a capacitor. OK, a simple capacitor, two parallel plates. And um, I will also paraphrase what it says to, exp to explain to you what it really means, is that it says the vol voltage between the terminals of a charged capacitor with a linear dielectric, OK, linear, I explain what it means, with the dielectric like the ones we used, all right? It has one scalar uh, parameter, epsilon, to characterize it. So let's assume that you have epsilon here. OK? The voltage is V. That's what they give us. And then it says what I would say. It does not say exactly that. But what I would like you to assume is that you remove this dielectric and you put another one. So if this is uh, epsilon 1, call it like that. I want it to. You put another one, epsilon 2. <laughs> epsilon 2 here. And uh, in fact, I, I show that here, but it, it is V. Let's assume now that what we keep the same is the charge, all right? So we have Q here and Q there. But I don't know what the V is going to be, all right? What the only thing that we know in this problem is that the electric flux density at every point here, as the electric flux densities in both cases are constant through the, s the material, all right? It's constant here and it's constant there, but they're not the same, obviously, between the two cases. They're different. But at every point here, you have the same electric flux density goes down like that, as we discussed. At every point here, you have a flux density that goes down like this. Okay. 
if the electric flux density of this problem is doubled, so we put a dielectric and we make the flux density here twice d2, and they're all, I'm writing them I like scalars. Why? Because they all have directions that we know. They're all along negative d. So if this d2 here, and this is d1, uh, if d2 becomes twice d1, what is going to be the voltage across the two parallel plates of the capacitor in this case? In this case, they give it to us as v, and then we know it's q. We keep q. We don't change q. We keep q. But we move it. We put a new dielectric. The new dielectric, it increases the flux density. It makes it double. So the question is, it gives you um, e five different possibilities. And then you will need to think of what <coughs> V is going to be in this case. From those cases that it gave you, you need to select the right, all right answer. Is that clear, what the, pr how the, what the problem is, the question? OK, so you will have, um, from the time I assign it, you will have five, six minutes, all right? I will tell you. We'll see how things go, and I will tell you when to stop. Any questions? All right, so. I will, um, I will take it away so I can see how you respond. So.
made myself clear. Um, the problem says the following. I tried to help you. The problem says that you have a dielectric, you have a D1, all right? For a moment, let's assume you have, you measure a D1, which is the flux density. And then you know that your voltage is V. And you measure, then you change something in your problem. I suggested here epsilon, but you change something in your problem. So your D2 becomes twice as much as D1. You keep Q the same. The charge remains the same. All right, I give it to you so it, to, to help you in, the conc in your conclusion. If you keep charge the same, and if you change your D, then of course your voltage, the voltage that applies between these, so your voltage difference between these two is going to be different, all right? Is that clear? Okay. So I keep the same charge. I know that I've made a change, so D2 now has changed, has become double. And I'm asking you to tell me what is going to happen to V, which is the voltage difference between these two. Maybe the, the way I have it here has confused people. Um, and I should probably say, OK, this is V, which is V1. V is V1 minus V2, all right? We know that this is V in this case. V is given to us, V. In this case, it's changing, though. And we want to find how much this voltage difference is. Is that clear? OK, thank you. Uh, Pardon me? Did, no, I did not unassign it. OK, let me see. Just a second. Just a moment. I, I don't think I did, but. OK. No, it's uh, did you? Yes, yes. Yes, you can assume that epsilon, so there are different possibilities of doing that, all right? If I assume, no, I can assume that epsilon is changing here. Not, you remember I put epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. I put epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 here. It, that is changing. You can do that. Yes. Do you? Uh, are you going to keep it the same? Yeah. You can assume. I made some change. Obviously. Let me just go back. In this problem, I went from here there. D two is not going to be able to change unless I change something in the problem. All right. Obviously. How many things can I change? Let's start with that. How many things can I change? Like what? Which ones? Well, um, we're talking about geometry now. Yeah. Epsilon or area. All right? 
or eight, for example. I could even, if I could, I could change the thickness. So there are, I could change any of the parameters to change the electric field. All right? Yes. What's that? So um, that's why I tried at this moment to tell you that we keep the charge constant. Mm -hmm. So let me try to solve it myself. If you, I, I, I think there is a lot of confusion. Let me try to solve the problem myself. And then, all right, because it's here just to think about the problem, not so much to. All right. So here is how I would solve the problem and say the following. Let me start with what it says. We have a capacitor, all right, to repeat it. We have a capacitor, and we have a voltage V. And we have a parallel plate. Obviously, that's all that they give us, all right? Let me just make sure that I see it myself. OK, it says here. The voltage between the terminals of a charge capacitor with a linear dielectric equals V. If the electric flux density at every point of the dielectric is doubled, now how we double? We have to change something, obviously. All right? Either we change the material, we change uh, the, the geometry, all right? Or you change the charge or something. In this case, I'm, I'm saying, let's assume that the charge is the same, just to keep something constant. So I um, change D, to, I double it. Now, what do we know about the electric field here and D? We know that the electric field here, sorry, is the D, for example, 1, is going to be epsilon 1 E1, all right? And D2 is going to be epsilon 2 E2. All right. Um, I gave also that Q is constant. So Q is constant. What do we know about D1? We know that D1 is Q over A. All right? If I have a charge Q and if I um, find the density, as I showed, it's going to be the, what we showed before. I skipped a, a, a step here. What I showed before is that D in a capacitor is really the surface charge density. Did we not say that when we computed it? OK, the surface charge density is nothing else but Q over A. What that means is, for me to double this, D1, if I want to keep Q constant, that means that I have to change the, val the, the A. Otherwise, I cannot double it. OK. So that means to, for this to double this in D2, <coughs> so D2 became which means that if D2 became twice D1, that A2 is half A1. OK? That's number one. Then, yes? Yes, that remains. So your electric field, therefore, here, this remains, which means from these two, what are you going to find out? That your D1 is epsilon 1 E1. D2, which is twice that, is going to be epsilon 2 E2. Now, you have a choice here. You can say, OK, let's assume that it's the same material, all right? If it's the same material, then what happens to E2? becomes double, all right? Then E2 is going to be 2E1. 
What happens when the electric field increases? The voltage is going to increase. Why is that? Assuming that this length is the same, all right, this uh, thickness. So then V is going to become 2, V2 is going to become 2V1. Assume that this is V1. All right, that's one case. Yes. Yeah, but I'm not talking about capacitance at this point. I'm talking about the voltage. If Q is the same, so you're going to a different formula. Can I go, can I wait for a moment until I go there? Okay, so in this particular case, we have that, all right? Assuming that these are epsilon. Okay, let's stick with that for a moment. So this is double V1. Capacitance. Capacitance is how much? Q over V, okay? If Q is the same, and the, so C1 is going to be Q over V1, and C2, the second case, is going to be Q over V2. If V2 became twice V1, what happens to C2? Half. But also, you can come to the same conclusion from here. All right? Why is that? Because of the, um, so you can come to the same conclusion that your capacitance will be half from here as well. Because there is a formula that relates your capacitance to your area, all right, epsilon area divided by thickness. Okay, why I, I gave this to you, and I will keep it on so you can go back this evening and do it. All right, do the problem again. I want you to do this problem because what happens is one of those that you have more parameters than to work with, than the data they have given you. And what happens in problems where your parameters that you can change are more than your given data? You have more than one possibilities, all right? So I'm going to write here the possibilities for you that you have. I'm going to rewrite the problem again, and then I will keep it on. So you will go home. I will change it so you can go back, because I don't know. Um, have you noticed whether you can put multiple? If you put one answer, can you go back and put another one? OK, perfect. So I don't want to change it, because sometimes you have to do that. But I will write it for you, and you go home, and you do it tonight, all right, or tomorrow. I'll keep it up until tomorrow afternoon. Yes. If you change epsilon, yes. So here is what happens, all right? So let me now go back and summarize. You have a problem with, uh, can I erase that for a moment? Okay. So you have a problem that has a number of parameters. So let me write the parameters here. What do you have? Voltage, one. Charge, you have area, let me write area here, area, you have epsilon, dielectric, all right, and then you have, they are of course this, and then thickness, H, so you have two electrical parameters, and then you have your geometrical parameters. And then you have some derivative electrical parameters, all right? What are the derivative electrical parameters? Of course, your electric field, that is the result of a, in this capacitor, your D. Now, I, uh, in this problem, I can fix, if I don't, if I fix and uh, a few parameters, but I leave many others undetermined, then your problem can have more than one solutions, all right? So in this particular case, what did I do? I only told you 
that this is constant. And then I only told you that in this case, your D2 is 2 D1. And what is it that you find? You find that in reality you have, um, and, and of course this has been the beginning, and I want to find the new one. I you find that you have an area that you can change, you have a dielectric you can change, and or you have a, an age you can change. And for any one of these, you, can, you may have a different value for V. So, um, example one. Let's assume, assume therefore in addition to what the problem gave you, assume that um, epsilon one equals epsilon two for the two cases. Assume that H one equals H two for the two cases, and area can change. That's one possibility, all right? Possibility number two, this is one. You can find an answer to this. Possibility number two, H1 is the same, area is the same, but epsilon can vary. I can put a different dielectric, and that will give you possibly a different answer, all right? Because what happens is that I have fixed only, I have so many parameters, but I fixed only two. And you have others that have not been specified. That is what this problem allows you to do. So here is what I'm going to do tonight. I'm, I'm going to change it right after the class. What I, will, I, I will augment the problem that is in the book. Because practically, in the, the way it is, is not, <laughs> is not uh, specified so you can find one single answer. And I will give you um, one to three possibilities. One is where I will specify enough parameters so you have only one to work with every time. And then I will ask you to find the solution. Is that okay? All right. So. Um, but I want you to, th w this is an example on how you take the formulas that we found, which is, what are the formulas? One is this one. What is the other one? D. What is the other one? Um, v, which is EL. All right, e, um, excuse me, EH. And then you have, com ah, and then the other one, D, that is Q over A. All right? And then, so these are your four equations. And then you can uh, use those to find what happens. If you fix some parameters, what, pa what happens to the others? It's just a practice. All right? Any question? Yes. Ah, I'm sorry. Thank you. A. Okay. Yes. If you have in a problem like this, if they give you a, uh, oh, you mean you're talking about? Excuse me, I did not hear the first part of it. No, it depends on how many other parameters you have you you have left undefined. So, it de um, you give you two conditions does not mean that you have two possible solutions. You may have three, depending on how many other parameters you have that need definition. Yes. In this specific example, if you assume that epsilon is the same, and this doubles, so this doubles. If this doubles, V doubles, okay. and that's it. In this, assuming the epsilon is the same, okay? okay? That's how it goes. Oh, if you assume epsilon is doubled, then? If you assume that epsilon is doubled, then E remains the same, V remains the same, oh. okay? Okay. Yeah. 
Now, if this doubles, you said epsilon doubles. This epsilon or this E? This one. If D doubles and epsilon doubles, what happens to E? No, no, I know. What happens to E? Constant. What is V? E times the thickness. H. Let me see which one. Let me write it. Tell me. Okay. What what told me? Um, yeah. Okay. If you you remember A is one of these areas that need to be fixed. You told me that you want to fix epsilon to two epsilon. Yes, that's right. All right. Then um, you cannot fix too many also because then your solution is not going to be possible. Because here, I'll, uh, let me just tell you why I'm saying that. If you come here and fix A, so in your case, you told me that I'm going to fix A, but I'm going to make epsilon two epsilon, mm -hmm. all right? I'm going to fix Q. That's what we said. If we do this, then we know the following. We know that V equals E H. Do we know that? OK. We know that D equals epsilon E. We've been told this doubles. If this doubles and this doubles, what happens to E remains the same. If E remains the same and H remains the same, this remains the same. OK, so this is one. We we'll go to this one. We said this doubles. This, now this remains the same. Now you tell me this remains the same. And H remains the same, which gets a different value for V, which is therefore there is no solution to it if you fix too many. See, this is the kind of problems that you get. If you fix too many, have you heard about problems which are underdetermined and overdetermined? OK, this is what happens here. If you underdetermine a problem, you have more than one solution. If you overdetermine the problem, you have no solution. So the fact that you get two different values for V tells you that you cannot have a solution for this problem the way you said it. Yes. Usually in a problem, I will set for you, I will set the parameters. For a design, for a design of a capacitor, then you have to know how many parameters you can fix only okay. to have a, a specific performance, a specific capacitance, or whatever else you want. Because if you fix too many, then you're not going to be able to design a capacitor like that cannot exist. Okay. If you fix too few, there will be more than one possibilities. Okay. Yes. Yes, go ahead. How do you know if you fix because you Because if you fix too many, you will find two different pos solutions for the same parameter. Yeah, how do I know which, uh, one, which two Oh, you see that here. One tells me that V remains the same from here. And the other one tells me that V be becomes what? Half of same and 0.5, whatever it was, all right? The new V. From the parameters? In this case, it tells you that of fixing all of this, because what we fixed here, we fixed A, we made epsilon 2E, we fixed Q. All right, we fixed H. Right. And it tells you you cannot fix all of them. Because you get two different values for V, for the voltage. Is that?
Okay, let's talk about on the side about that. All right, so we are going to fix this problem. Uh, I'm going to change, I should say, not fix, I will change the problem so you can do more than one cases. All right. This, uh, I have to tell you, <laughs> yes, this particular one, the way it's written in the book, has no particular answer, not one single answer. No. This one does not. And that's what I wanted to have to, to work with this because you can see how many parameters you can fix or not in a problem. In a design problem, when you do a capacitor, you are going to design capacitors, all right? You're not going to just analyze them. When you design capacitors, you, know, you have to know how many parameters you can fix. Okay, is there any questions about this particular problem? Okay, I hope I, this problem, if you solve it, you will be able to understand, not, it will help you understand the material more in depth and not superficially. All right, that's, that's what you need to be able to understand, what we're talking about, wh why those relationships are important and what they mean, really. Okay. Um, the other thing that I will do, there are two more problems, and the other one, one more I will use, I will open it for you as well to do it so we can finish the class. You will do it later, all right? And it's a problem, if I remember, uh, let me see. It's a problem for dielectric. Um, it's, it, it has to do with uh, boundary conditions on dielectric interfaces. I will open those problems, and then you will have the opportunity to do them until tomorrow afternoon, all right? OK. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about Let me just, uh, at this moment, I don't believe I need this anymore. Um, we are going to talk about electric currents. Okay, let us assume now that we have a material, a piece of material, and um, it's like this. And then we place two, con two conductors, plates, two plates, I should call them, one here and one there, conducting plates, all right? Have you seen capacitors in the lab? The tiny ones, they look like this. They have two metal plates and they have the electric in between. Okay, now I did this now just for, um, the, for explaining the, uh, what conduction current is. Now, in a conducting material, what we call conducting materials, we have, um, when they, there is no il a voltage applied, or there is no electric field applied, all right? These materials are neutral. Again, it means that all of the electrons um, rotate around or move around a nucleus and they cancel charges each other, negative and positive. And so it's totally elec electrically neutral. When you either place a voltage between these two which means that, like with the capacitors, all right, that you're going to have positive charges here, negative charges here, and then you're going to have an electric field here like this. Then if this is a conducting material, all of these free electrons here 
are going to move like that. All right? And if, they if electrons move like this, then the positive charges will move like that. In fact, I should probably change wrong, should correct myself. They, they, this will attract with the positive charges. This will go like this, and this will go like that, OK? OK, for the, what the voltage I place. All right, so and the electric field that applies here is like this. Now, we, uh, since the charges will start flowing into different directions, we are going to have a change of um, the charge we are going to see on the two conductors. All right? So if we are to consider a volume that includes both the conductors and the material, you're going to see that there is going to be a, a change in charge. We now define this change in charge as an electric current. And then here I have to be careful, of course, with um, how I in what I indicate by Q. In this particular case, Q is the total charge here. All right? So if there is a change in the total charge, then we have a current that flows through this um, material, the conducting material. And the direction we take by convention is that if electrons flow like this, and then the holes or the positive charges go like that, then the direction of this current that is created because of the change in the charges is like the one that I have. All right? Now, if we go from this very specialized case to another more general and say, let's assume now that I have a volume. All right? And the volume has a surface that encloses it with a direction n. And let's assume that I have a charge Q in this. And I find that as time changes, this charge changes. So I have a reduction in the charge, which means what? That this number is going to be negative, all right? If this is then therefore negative, that means that the charge in here is going to reduce, which means what? That there is going to be a positive flow of current outside of the volume, all right? And that's why we have this negative sign here. So that reduces, that means there is a current flowing like that. That increases, there is a current flowing in the other direction. This is called a um, conduction current. And if I go now and simplify this picture and say, let's assume that I have just a material. And I place this material in an electric field, all right? I forget about the conductors and the other potential, the voltage, and so forth. So I have this material that is conducting, so it's characterized by this constant, which is called conductivity. And in this one, I have an electric field, E. Then this, yes? It's called conducting material. Conducting materials can be from perfect conductors 
to dielectrics that have a little bit of conductivity, all right? Usually when I say conducting material, most of the time I mean materials that um, have um, enough of conduction current, the sigma, sigma. They are not pure dielectrics, obviously. Pure dielectrics have no sigma. Pure dielectrics do not have, we assume, do not have free electrons. We assume that they only have dipole moments. So all of the electrons are bound around the atoms. Conducting materials, we assume that they do have dipole moments, but they have a lot of free electrons. Yes? Yes, that's right. OK, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and as a matter of fact, so of course there is an electric field. Because of the conductivity, they also have a current, I, which is related to the electric field. So a very simple um, relationship. But um, I will, in fact, I will write this here. In fact, let me be careful. The total current here is going to be I. But in here, because there is a volume, there is going to be a current density. All right? So again, Q is charged. I is total current. current. Charges are measured in, are measured in coulombs and in currents in amperes. So this is a current, this is a charge. Then we have the um, current density. And we only have two current densities, the surface current density and the line current density. All right? I mean, the, uh, there is no, I should say, so we have a J, which is amps per meter squared, and then a J, who can be amps per meter. But that's all we have. All right? Yes. So um, because the current is not like a, a um, the current shows a flow. It's not like a charge that remains in space in one point. The current has a flow in and out, all right? Um, so you cannot have a, a volume current density in m cubed, because the current flows in one particular direction, all right? Yes. For a con this conductor, for example, your charge density here is going to be amps per meter squared. And if you want to find the total current, you have to find the cross-section of this. Let's assume it's like a something like that. You have to find the cross-section, which is A. And if you want to find the total current, the total current is going to be J times A assuming that J is uniform, all right? And if you, the electric field is uniform, and since you multiply the electric field, J, therefore, here is sigma E. Since in order to find your J, you have to multiply your E with a constant, then um, your I, which is going to be in amps, is going to be that current density times area, OK? Um, all right. Let me see. There are some very simple examples, depending on how much time we have. We don't have too much time for those, but we will uh, solve them next time. On, on Wednesday. Very simple examples on how you calculate, for example, the total current from a current density. Um,
Okay. So tomorrow, one more thing. If you, tomorrow we have from 3.10 to 5, all right? At the same place where we were last time, Kemper 1006. What? Ah, Git Hall. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Sorry.